Everyone quiet. Sounds like we have a visitor approaching. Hello, fellow traveler. You look tired. We're on a long road trip and stopped here to set up camp. You're welcome to rest here for the night. There's always room around our fire. So have a seat. The food's hot, the drinks are cold, the fire is warm, and the stories, hopefully, are scary. I'm Jeremy, and I'm the driver on these road trips we take, but for the night, I'll be your storyteller. So settle in for some stories from the road. Tonight's story is called The Strange Fate of Victoria Simpson, and this is another one of those stories author unknown. It was early 2014, and I was working as a live-in carer. It wasn't as bad as all that, certainly not as bad as some of the jobs I'd done. The woman I was caring for didn't need a lot of help in terms of taking care of herself. There were just a few physical tasks that were hard for her at her age and in her condition. I was more of a maid than a carer, in all honesty. She was still sharp as a tack, wicked smart and with a biting sense of humor. And the house she lived in. It was easily one of the most magnificent homes I'd ever set foot in. It was like if you got Howard Hughes and Gomez Adams to design a mansion. Four floors, easily over a hundred rooms, a room for every possible function, sometimes more than one. A library, a game room, a screening room, uh, this old projector and all these old films set up and ready to go. A drawing room, a kitchen, uh, this great dining room with a table you could seat two dozen people around. I could go on. From the outside, the place looked like it had seen better days to be sure. It was overgrown with ivy and the brickwork was crumbling in places to be sure, but on the inside, oh, on the inside it was beautiful. I mean it was my job to keep it looking that way, just like it had been the job of the person before me. Dusting, sweeping, cleaning, these were all the duties I had to perform as part of my employment. But I was certainly paid well enough for it, more than I'd been paid at my job before or any job since. The woman I was caring for was this old Hollywood actress. Victoria Simpson was her name. I remember on the first day I made a crack about her last name. Asked her if she was any relation to Homer and Marge. She gave me a look, and after that, I never tried to joke with her again. Oh, I'd laugh at hers when she made them, but I decided I would uh, be better keeping my own attempts at humor to myself. She wasn't an ogre or anything. She could be bad-tempered in that kind of general way I think a lot of people get when they're older. She had that anger I'd seen in my own grandparents and my parents, too, at the fact that she was getting older, and things that had come easily now were more and more challenging. She wasn't cruel or spiteful. Not to me, anyway. I'd been warned by the last person to hold the job that she could be challenging. But to be honest, after the first few weeks, we settled into a fairly easy routine. I'd do my chores. Uh, When she needed me, she'd press a buzzer or ring her little bell or just call out. Uh, That was how it went. No, I never had any problem with her. The house itself, though, that took a little getting used to. As I said, there were a lot of rooms, and some of them had some of the strangest things in them. There was one room. It was just, it was full of these strange little puppets, marionettes, ton of them all carefully sculpted and incredibly strange to look at. And there was a room with this great carousel, a hideous looking thing. It didn't have horses on it, it had these figures, stuffed taxidermy animals, but animals that had been poised to look like they were alive. Not just alive, but walking upright, walking or running or jumping like people. These awful glassy eyes and gaping toothy mouths and little paws and claws posed as if they were in the middle of playing a game together or giving chase. I always dusted that room first when when it was time to clean around the place so that I could get it done right away. I can't say why they made me so uneasy. I'd seen stuffed animals before. But there was something a little too... I don't know. Lifelike? No, no, that's not it. They didn't just look like they had been alive, which obviously they had. They looked like they were still alive. Like at any moment they were going to spring to life and play in caper. Uh, 
like those glassy eyes were watching me every move, watching my every move, carefully and intently. Every time I cleaned that room, it felt like they were judging how I did my job. And then, there were the noises at night. All old houses make noises. Creaking floorboards, rattling window panes. I know Hollywood likes to make us think each one is proof that, there is, that the place is haunted or that there's a madman living in the walls or something, but the truth is that sometimes strange noises in an old house are just an old house making strange noises. But all the same, the first few nights, I did find it a little unnerving. I'd hear these odd little sounds and find my mind wandering to all kinds of morbid things. And there were times, usually at night, but sometimes during the day. There were times when I'd think I'd catch sight of something, out of the corner of my eye. There'd never be anything there when I looked properly. In the end, I told myself it was probably just a mouse. The house was out in the country and very old. It would be easy for one to get in through the cracks and gaps in its exterior. Or maybe I was just imagining things. I remember the day when things started to get bad, though. Or at least the day that I think heralded the change. It started out ordinary enough. I'd finished preparing a soup for Miss Simpson's lunch and I went through the house calling her name. I finally found her in her little viewing room. She had the projector on and music playing and a glass of scotch in her hand. One of her old films was playing and she was lost in it. I felt like I was intruding and I went to leave, but she spoke. She must have heard me there on the threshold. She spoke in this terribly sad voice. I could have done so much more, you know. If I'd stuck to it, if I'd seen it through, if I'd gone that bit further. I told her that I had lunch prepared, prepared if she would like it now, and she turned and looked at me as if she had only just realized who was there, as if being reminded that it was me that had caught her off guard. And then she just turned back towards the screen. The worst thing you can ever tell someone, you know, follow their dream. We never tell the poor bastards where it'll lead. I got the feeling that she was off in her own world right now. I placed the soup down on the table beside her and told her if she needed anything I'd be nearby. She didn't respond. I didn't see her again until later that day. She invited me to join her for a drink. I got the fire going and she poured us both a brandy. I insisted on having just a small one. In all honesty, I shouldn't have been drinking at all. But I reasoned that a small drink wouldn't do any harm. We sat there, the fire crackling away. It was the only light in the room, and it threw the most marvelous and strange-looking shadows across the room and over the two of us. She asked me what I wanted out of life. She asked me what my aspirations were, my dreams. I racked my brain for a proper response, and she quickly became impatient. Well, you can't want to look after an old wreck like me your whole life, girl. You're young, fairly pretty. I can't imagine there's much stopping you from getting out there, getting what you want. I admitted that I hadn't really thought much about it. The honest truth, truth was that I didn't really have a plan for my life. Things just sort of happened, one after the other. I could tell that this response didn't really fill her with joy, and I felt like I was in the presence of a stern and disapproving grandmother, or a particularly caustic teacher annoyed at her pupil's dim-witted nature. When I was your age, I knew exactly what I wanted, and I got it. No matter what it cost, no matter what it had to do, I got it. I didn't know what to say, but she was speaking before I got the chance to offer anything in a way of response to this. The drink had definitely loosened her tongue. Lawton. God, what a bastard that man was. Oh, you wouldn't know what to look at him, but everyone who got close enough to him knew. They could see what was behind that twinkle in his eyes, sure enough. I imagine she was thinking back bitterly on some past director she'd worked with. Someone for whom she'd had a bad experience or who perhaps she had done some kind of favor for. We're all pretty familiar with the Hollywood casting couch at this point, aren't we? I asked her if Lawton was someone she'd worked with when she'd been an actor. She snorted and poured herself another drink. 
<laughs> oh, you could say that. Marcus Lawton. Thought that man was an ass right from the start. If I'd known, well, I'd probably still have done it. Sounds like you didn't like him much, I offered, which I realized sounded lame as soon as I said it. She snorted with laughter once more, but I got the impression it wasn't at the nature of my remark. It felt more like she was laughing at her own private little joke. No one liked Lawton. We just needed him. He made things happen. If you helped him, if you got him what he what, what he blah, blah, blah. if you helped him, if you got him what he wanted, if you kept him him and his lot happy. I wasn't sure what that meant, and there was something in the way she said it that made me think I'd rather not know. As we sat there in the firelight, the silence in the room became uncomfortable. She was looking at me closely, studying me, as if she was only properly seeing me for now for the first time. You seen them yet? I paused, the drink halfway to my lips. I told her I didn't know what she meant, but her stare. It made me feel like I was something on a high school workbench being dissected and studied. I squirmed uncomfortably in the seat beneath her gaze. You have, haven't you? I can always tell. Happened with the girl before you, Jenna, or Jenny, or Jamie, or whatever her damn name was. It had, in fact, been Jenny, but I didn't bother to correct her on that point. I was more curious about what she was talking about, and I asked her that very thing, as delicately and politely as I could. She smiled, showing off a mouthful of pearly white false teeth. Smiled and raised her glass to me as if toasting my success at something. Oh, you know, corner of your eye? They're quick as a flash when they want to be, but, they're li- but they like being seen. What are? I asked her. What gets left behind? She didn't, ex- didn't explain further that night. She announced that she was ready for bed, and as I took her up, in her, up to her room, I kept my questions to myself. Oh, I had plenty of them, don't get me wrong, but I also got the impression that now wasn't the time to ask them, and she didn't seem to be in any hurry to offer any further information that night. I locked my door once I was in my room, and it still took me longer than usual to get off to sleep as I told myself that the odd creaks and groans that were a normal part of the house didn't sound closer to my bedroom door than they had on the previous evenings. I was on edge a lot the following days. Each noise made me start. Each time I thought I caught something just on the edge of my vision. It made me whip my head around, my body tense. I felt like a gazelle in a lion enclosure. Victoria was much less chatty over the next few weeks. She spent a lot of time in the viewing room, watching her old films. I'd often walk past and see her there, drink in hand. Lost in her memories of when things had been better for her, I suppose. Though she rarely seemed all that happy afterwards, it was maybe a month after that that the first strange uh, after that first strange conversation that things took another odd turn. I was eating dinner with her, a rare occurrence, but one that was normally enjoyable as she'd often rattle off anecdotes from the hilarious and scandalous to the poignant and moving about actors she'd worked with, experiences she'd had, and friends she'd lost. This time, however, when she spoke up, it was to ask me a question, blunt and direct, accompanied by a hard stare. What would you do to get what you want? I wasn't entirely sure what she meant or why she was asking me this, and I asked her what she meant. She scoffed, her eyes still locked upon me. (laughs) It's a simple enough question, girl. To get what you want, what would you do? How far would you go? Is there anything you wouldn't do? I don't know if something had gone missing and she was accusing me of something, if she thought I'd stolen something valuable or something like that, and if I was wrong, I'd feel intensely awkward about bringing up the possibility. So I just answered as carefully as I could that of course there were things I wouldn't do, for any reason. Again, she scoffed. (laughs) Oh, We all thought that at once. Oh, we all thought that once. Before we met Lawton, we all thought that. I cleared my throat nervously, trying not to show my discomfort. Lawton. 
He he was the the director you mentioned, wasn't he? Marcus Lawton was a lot of things, girl. And yes, a director too, I suppose. She chuckled to herself and drank deeply from the glass of wine beside her. She was no longer staring at me, but I still felt the same uncomfortable energy in the room. Oh, just look at you. We'd have eaten you alive, you know. Chewed you up and spat you out. Soft. That's what your generation is. Soft. Don't know what it is to need. Don't know what it is to burn inside. Lawton burned. Burned himself up in the end, but God how he burned. And we all burned with him. Before I could ask anything more, I don't. Uh, though I don't really know what I would have asked in response to this, she announced that she was feeling too tired to finish her meal and asked me to help her up to bed. As I did so, we passed by some of her old posters on the walls, her eyes lingering on each one as we passed them by. I was so desperate, so eager, so naive at first. But I learned. Oh, I learned. You've got to have teeth to survive, girl. Gotta be strong. Gotta make sacrifices. She chuckled at herself. To, uh, she chuckled at that to herself and then went silent again for a while. It was after she was tucked up in bed that she spoke for the final time that night, and I wasn't even sure if it was to me or the room. Burn the others up one by one. Won't be long now. Can feel it. They're eager. Can't wait to get their claws into me. Because I was once again feeling too unsettled to sleep that night, I stayed up on my laptop and attempted to find out what I could about the man she'd mentioned. I expected to find out that Lawton had been some kind of 1930s Harvey Weinstein, in all honesty, but I'd not been at all prepared for what I actually discovered as I searched through the results. Lawton's family had come over from Ireland sometime in the early 1900s and his parents had passed away when he was still fairly young. There had been a period of his life where he'd been mostly unaccounted for and then in 1927 he'd made the scene, flush with cash and rubbing shoulders with the rich and powerful. Partly because he was supplying them all with the drugs and women they could ever ask for. Like a cocaine-fueled Jay Gatsby, He'd found himself a figure of both fame and infamy among the right people and a lot of the wrong ones uh, and had begun directing, writing and producing his own pictures sometime in the mid-30s. Despite, or perhaps because of the scandal and rumor that dogged him, he'd had no shortage of big stars uh, of the time lining up for his parts in his films. However, Things had come to a sordid end when in 1949, during the performance of a play he'd written and produced by the unwieldy name of The Clockmaker and His Apprentice, A Cautionary Tale, there had been an act of arson at the theater that claimed the lives of the cast and crew, though not the life of Marcus Lawton, who was found to have slit his own wrists after setting himself on fire in a truly gargantuan and grotesque act of murder-suicide. It was after this that much more about him came to light. Allegations by various actresses, the youngest of whom was only 14 years old, of sexual abuse, harassment, and acts so appalling that many detective wor detectives working the case retired rather than to see it to completion. It was also found that, far from being only a rapist and a drug abuser, Lawton was a person of interest in a number of truly bizarre missing persons cases. The accounts about his behavior in his final days detailed how he'd become firmly, firmly convinced that he'd been tasked with feeding souls tainted by violence to some kind of entity or entities that many believed he'd simply manufactured in his own warped head. Only two of the films he'd made still existed in any form and had understandably not seen any kind of commercial release. IMDB did have cast lists for all six of the films he'd worked on, However, and I noticed as I looked through them that Victoria's name didn't appear once. It certainly left the question of how she'd known him, but having read what I, what I had so far, I found myself perfectly alright with not knowing the answer to that question. Something happened a few days after that. Something happened that I can't explain. That I haven't told anyone about because... Well, because I thought they would think I was crazy. 
There's a lot that happened in those final weeks I was at the house that I can properly explain, and this was definitely the first incident that made me stop and think maybe I should just leave. I was cleaning one of the halls, and as had become more and more frequent, I saw something out of the corner of my eye, and when I turned to look, it was one of the animals. One of the little taxidermy animals from the carousel. This little fox. Peeking its head around the corner, glassy eyes gleaming, stood on its hind legs, that little green and purple waistcoat sewn to its body, one of its little stiff paws resting on the wall, that mouth unnaturally gaping open showing off those pointy little teeth. Those glass eyes looking right at me, its head cocked to the side. I dropped the broom I'd been holding and it clattered to the ground and the sound made me start, made me blink, and it was gone. I went to check. As insane as that must sound, I went to check the carousel in that strange little room. The fox was still there, in its usual place, along with the cats and rabbits and dogs. Stiff and unmoving and thoroughly dead. And even if it had been alive, it couldn't have stood that way, stood the way that thing in the corridor had stood. I locked the room from the outside. I didn't want to go near it. I didn't want to be anywhere near it ever again. It wasn't as if Miss Simpson used the room as far as I could tell except for storage. I doubted she'd notice if it wasn't being being kept clean. Let those ghastly old things gather dust and be left alone. I asked her about them one day. I was serving her a meal and I asked her as casually as I could about where they'd come from. If they'd been props from a movie she'd worked on. Um, If they'd been props from a movie she'd worked on. I desperately wanted there to be something thoroughly mundane, some thoroughly mundane explanation for their presence, something that would help me convince myself that what I'd seen had been my mind playing tricks on me because of unner- how unnerved I'd been recently. She looked at me as if she could tell right away that there was something more than polite interest behind my question. She smiled this odd smile. Oh, they were from a film, all right, but not one of mine one of his and they were a good deal more than props i can tell you i asked her what she meant and she just chuckled chuckled and muttered about how maybe she'd show me one day before adding to herself one day soon not many days left i'm sure those reading this think i should have quit looking back i think i should have as well but the money the money at this job was incredible and I hadn't been put in the way of any harm. I'd just been spooked by some strange noises and seen something that I re- something that I reasoned couldn't have been real. I deluded myself into thinking there was nothing to worry about, convinced myself that it would be all fine. Then came my last day working there. The weeks beforehand had been sh- the week beforehand had been a strange one. Victoria had been more and more reluctant to engage in any way, instead often shutting herself up in the viewing room with the door closed. I'd hear her muttering to herself often and talking to the empty air around her as if she was convinced she was being pestered by a a nosy and invasive crowd. I would only ever catch little snippets of what she said, but it was clear that she was in a very anxious state of mind. Go away. Go away. Not like the others. Not like the others didn't do worse. Didn't do worse than I did. Knew what you were getting into. All of you should have known what you were getting into. Stupid little wretches. Stupid little things getting into trouble. Not yet. Not yet. The others go to... The others go take the others leaving me... (laughs) Not yet. Not yet. The others go. Take the others leaving me be. Just leave it be. I was becoming more and more worried that her mental uh, faculties weren't as strong as I'd believed them to be. I considered whether I should do something about this, but she had always seemed so lucid and so intelligent before now. And the house, with the exception of the one unsettling room, was such a beautiful home that clearly meant a lot to her. The thought of taking her away from it to uh, to be shut up in some old folks home was heartbreaking to me. On top of that, the sounds at night had begun to become more and more strange. It was no longer just creaking floorboards and rattling windows. At night, I could hear this strange and rapid clicking, 
this tick 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 sound that reminded me of a sound of dog of a dog's claws on the hardwood floor as if multiple animals were rapidly running about in the house scampering and skittering through it curiously my mind went to that strange room that strange locked room and its eerie little carousel and then it had been the sound that alerted me there had been a loud clatter like something heavy had fallen Instantly, I had nightmarish visions of Victoria's wheelchair tipping over or of her going sprawling down the stairs. I ran through the house, calling her name, looking for her. Ahead of me, a door slammed shut and I ran towards it. It was locked and I banged my fist on the door, asking if she was in there, if she was alright. There was a click and the door gave way. As I pushed it inward, I took in the sight for a moment. All other thoughts left me. There was a click and the door gave way. As I pushed it inward, I took in the sight and for a moment all other thought left me. The room was piled high with papers, dozens and dozens of papers, many of which had been tacked or stapled or glued to the walls. The ones that were on the walls were all of the same kind. Each and every one was a missing persons poster. They were ancient and yellowed with age, clearly from decades ago at least. Sad little faces, many of them children and some teenagers and young adults looked out from them. I stared at the strange room, my mind struggling to comprehend what exactly I was seeing here. I'd never seen this room before, which, uh, which was strange in and of itself. It must have been locked during the months I'd been here. Perhaps I'd been told it was simply a storage closet or something of that kind. But seeing what was in there now, my mind struggled to explain it. I didn't dwell on it, though. I remember the reason I'd raced over to it in the first place, and, as Victoria clearly wasn't there, I proceeded to run through the house in search of her. There was no answer to my shouts, but I found her. She was in her usual spot in the viewing room, her back to me and drink in hand. On the screen, it appeared that another one of her old black and white films was playing out across the screen. I asked her if she was alright, frantic and breathless. If she noticed the state I was in, she didn't comment on it. In fact, she didn't even look at me. Her eyes were firmly on the screen. Her hand trembled slightly. We all think ourselves such good people, don't we? That there are things we would never do for any reason. But what he offered. He could see it in us. Which of us would do it? Which of us wouldn't? I think that's why I hate the ones who never got the offer. What was in them that was so good that I didn't have? What made them better than me? I had no idea what she was talking about. I didn't even know if she was talking to me or once again talking to thin air. The ice in her drink rattled as her hand shook. And when it was done, well, it was too late, wasn't it? We'd done the worst. Might as well keep doing it. We knew what they'd do if we didn't. And now, here they come. Here they come for all of us, one by one with their little paws and jaws and claws, coming to get what's theirs. I asked her again if she was all right. She clearly wasn't. And then my eyes flitted to the screen and I stared in horror. Stared in horror at what happened on the screen. Because what was playing wasn't one of her films. Or at least it wasn't one that had been released to the general public in theaters. On the screen, I could see the carousel. I recognized the black and white forms of the taxidermy animals in their little waistcoats and hats and boots. And tied to the middle of the carousel was a young boy. He was tied and clearly terrified. The younger Victoria stood, dressed in finery and holding a knife. Using that knife. Using it on the boy. I told myself this had to be a horror film she'd starred in. I told myself that this couldn't be what I thought it was, couldn't really be what I was seeing. And then, as I watched, as I watched the carousel seemingly spring to life, and then as I watched, as I watched the carousel seem to spring to life, twirling and flashing, if there had been sound, I'm sure I would have heard it playing some merry tune. And the animals on the carousel, they were moving. Moving in ways that I couldn't explain. 
Ways that couldn't be written off as skilled puppetry or stop motion. Moving in ways that can only be described as the movements of actual living things. I watched as their heads turned towards the bleeding boy, their paws and claws making contact with his helpless body. The carousel world. The boy silently screamed, wide gaping animal mouths stretching in wide animal grins. The young Victoria on the screen soaked herself in the blood. From somewhere in the house I could hear the skittering of paws. The skittering of paws and a carnival theme playing from somewhere within the bowels of the building. I ran to my car, parked outside the house as I ran through the building. Uh, I ran to my car, parked outside the house. As I ran through the building, I could hear Victoria screaming. I could hear the sound of shattering glass. I could hear growls and what sounded like gravelly whispering voices issuing from mouths not made for human speech. I could hear something terrible. As soon as I was locked in my car, I called the police. I babbled out something about intruders about what I'd seen on the film. I made enough sense to them that they sent someone to the house. When they arrived, they found me hunched up in the car and trembling, and they found what had happened to Victoria Simpson. They found her body tied to the carousel, I found out later, tied to it and mutilated and interfered with in ways that suggested a ritualized nature to the attack. I was questioned but never seriously considered as a suspect, both because of the state they found me in and because it was obvious to those investigating that I wouldn't have been strong enough to inflict the kind of damage that had been done to the body. It was ultimately ruled as a home invasion murder by a person or persons unknown. It was what else they found in the house that interested me more, though. Victoria Simpson was in possession of a dozen of what can only be described as snuff films, all of which starred her, all of which involved her performing violent, depraved, and unnatural acts on innocent victims or victims and on the innocent victim or victims in the film. Many of those who appeared in the films were those who appeared on the missing persons posters I'd found in that strange small room. Missing persons cases that dated back to the 30s and had remained unsolved to this time. I wasn't surprised to find out that in addition to Victoria, Marcus Lawton appeared in many of the snuff films in her possession. I continued to work as a carer for a few years after this incident. I'm happy to say I never had anything close to this happen to me again. And I'm sure it would make for a good spooky twist if I told you that those strange stuffed animals from the carousel stalked me for the rest of my life, or that I see Victoria Simpson's ghost... But the truth is, nothing strange has happened to me since that day. The only ghosts I'm haunted by are the memories. Memories of working for her for all that time. Never suspecting what she had done. What she was capable of. The memories, the memory what I saw on that film. The memory of what I saw on that film. What I saw those strange and monstrous animal forms doing to that poor boy. Of the way they moved. The unnatural way they moved that I still can't explain. That simply shouldn't have been possible. That couldn't have been faked and yet also couldn't have been, uh, couldn't possibly have been real. And the memory of that rasping, growling voice I heard as I ran from the house and left Victoria Simpson to her fate. Time to come with us now, Victoria. Time to come play with us. All right. That is the end of the story. And again, that was The Strange Fate of Victoria Simpson, author unknown. Uh, about a 30-minute long episode, or story rather. Not too bad. Um, appreciate you guys stopping in tonight and checking out the story. And uh, if you have any, any suggestions for any stories you'd like to read, uh, you can reach me on my social medias. Full Moon Empty Road on TikTok, Full Moon Empty RD on Twitter, FMER Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Um, also, while you're listening to the story, go over to the Bonfire page and uh, pick up a shirt. I still haven't made a sale. <laughs> kind of depressing. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But yeah, if you'd like, go over there and buy a shirt. And um, hope everybody enjoyed the story tonight. And I think it is time we all go to bed. So let's keep that fire burning low. Good night, everyone.